Hello students. Today we're going to look at finding domains algebraically. Now in the last lesson we looked to see how we can figure out the domain of a function based on its graph. However, sometimes we won't be looking at the graph of a function, we might be looking at its equation, and we might still want to figure out the domain. Luckily, there are only a few situations that we really have to worry about when we're dealing with domains, at least with the functions that we know so far. And so we can pretty easily figure out the domain of a function based on its equation. Let's consider two different functions to start with. Let's consider f of x equals 1 over x minus 2, and g of x equals the square root of x plus 3. Now, there are two things that can cause trouble with functions, specifically two things where we can end up with a quantity that's undefined. Do you remember what those two things are? Well, one thing that can cause us to end up with something that's undefined is to have a denominator that's equal to zero, because we know that we're not allowed to divide by zero. So the thing that we have to watch out for there is that the denominator cannot equal zero. The other thing that we have to worry about is that we can't take the square root of a negative quantity. In a situation like that, it is undefined. So the inside of a square root symbol or a radical symbol, the quantity inside, we call that the radicand. And so the radicand, the expression inside of a square root, has to be greater than or equal to zero. We know that it can't be negative. And so these are the two things that we need to look out for when we're looking for the domain of a function. If we have a function where there's a variable in the denominator, we have to make sure that the denominator is not equal to zero. And if we're taking the square root of a quantity, we have to make sure that the radicand, the inside, is greater than or equal to zero, meaning it's not negative. These are actually the two ways that we can figure out what the domains are going to be. Let's take a look first at f of x. We have f of x is equal to 1 over x minus 2. We know that the denominator cannot equal zero. In this case, what is the denominator? Well, the denominator is x minus two, so we know that x minus two cannot be equal to zero. I've replaced the word denominator with the actual denominator of this function. Now we have an inequality, and if we can get x alone, that will give us the restriction on x. To get x alone, we add 2 to both sides of the inequality. That leaves us with x alone on the left, and 0 plus 2 is 2 on the right. And so we get x cannot equal 2, and that actually is the restriction for our domain. We can just write the domain here, it's the set of x, such that x is not equal to 2. If we check this, if we plug in 2 here, 2 minus 2 is 0, and we end up with 1 divided by 0, which is undefined. Any other number than 2 is okay, because any other number minus 2 is not 0, and then we don't have a 0 in the denominator, so we're good. So whenever we have an expression that has a variable in the denominator, we have to take the denominator and set it not equal to zero and solve. This gives us the restriction for our domain. Now let's look at g of x. Here we have g of x equals the square root of x plus three. We know that the radicand has to be greater than or equal to zero. In this case, the radicand is x plus three. So we know that x plus three must be greater than or equal to zero. This gives us an inequality that we can solve, and once we have the solution,
we have the restriction for our domain. To get x alone, we subtract 3 from both sides of the inequality, giving us x is greater than or equal to negative 3, and that's the restriction on the domain. The domain here is the set of numbers x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Whenever we have a function that has a square root in it, and there's a variable inside the square root, we take the radicand and set it greater than or equal to zero. We solve the corresponding inequality, and that gives us the restriction that gives us our domain. These are the two things that we need to look for. A variable in the denominator, in which case we make sure the denominator is not equal to zero, or a variable inside a radical, inside a square root, in which case we need to make sure that the radicand is greater than or equal to zero. If we have a function that doesn't have a variable in the denominator or a variable inside a radical, such as h of x equals 3x squared minus 5x plus 1 half, then we're not in danger of having a zero in a denominator or taking the square root of a negative number. If that's the case, we can just say that the domain is all real numbers, which we write as the set of numbers x such that x is a real number. And then we're good. The one thing I do want to say here is I want to talk about radicals. If we have a square root of something, then the radicand has to be greater than or equal to zero because we can't take the square root of a negative number and end up with a real answer. However, if we have a cube root, then all real numbers are okay for the radicand because we are allowed to take the cube root of a negative number. That's no problem. For example, the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. But then if we look at a fourth root, again, we can't take the fourth root of a negative number, so then that radicand has to be greater than or equal to 0. In general, if the index, which is the number up here is even, we have to make sure that the radicand is greater than or equal to zero. But if the index is odd, then it's okay to take the radical of a negative number. We generally don't write the index when it's two because these are the most common and to just save time, we write square root.